and digital archaeology, global information systems, GIS for spatial and for spatial analysis and site preservation. So how archaeologists use this mysterious GIS. But first I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm frozen. Oh, there we go. Um, so the Indiana University Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology acknowledges and honors the indigenous communities native to this region and recognizes that Indiana University Bloomington was built on indigenous homelands of the Miami, Shawnee, Potawatomi, and Delaware people. We respect indigenous people and their many descendants who traversed or resided in this place and who fashioned and used objects that repose in this museum. The museum is committed to participating and collaborating with indigenous partners on the co-creation of knowledge, scholarship, and education. So what is GIS? GIS is an acronym for Geographic Information Systems, um, which is a fancy way of saying it's a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps data, and in my case, archeological data. And we do that by using software called ArcGIS, which was um, released in 1999. It's been out for quite a while. And um, through that software, we create multi-layered maps by integrating images and spatial data. So you can see in the background here, I have um, a screenshot of our GIS database that I created for Angel Mounds, um, which compiles data from 80 years of archaeological investigations um, from many, many different archaeologists. And using this software, you, you organize and analyze data. So we organize data into layers that can be toggled on and off. So if you want to see the houses, you turn those on. If you don't want to see them, you want to see what's underneath, you turn that off. And then you can also manipulate data to, um, that's attached to images and spatial information to display things in different ways, different colors, different aspects of the data, and um, the way they're distributed across your map. Then basically, you use it to make maps. And I like to think about it like playing around, because you can really spend a lot of time in this program um, playing around with your information until you're mapping the info that you want. And then you export your map. GIS can also be used to tell stories um, through digital story mapping. And this is an example uh, made by Mike Mortimer, um, who's a historian a postdoc here at IU. It's the um, Akwesasne interactive map that he created. And um, you could actually check them out on his website, which is listed here. So how does GIS help archeologists? Um, Archaeological excavation is irreversible. When you remove dirt from the ground, you can't put it back. So we must document everything in, in detail. And GIS is a really great tool for doing that. Um, it preserves the data digitally and you can monkey around with it all you want after. Um, so we use GIS for preparation for archaeological investigations for curation of data recorded during excavations and also curation of data from previous excavations in the, in the distant past. We use it as an analytical tool and also more recently to track preservation of sites over time. So in terms of preparation, if you're, if you're planning an archeological investigation or um, a dig, uh, you might start by making a landscape base map. So I have examples here from my dissertation research at the Audrey North site in West Central Illinois. Um, on the left, I chose aerial imagery. Um, it's a very flat area, so elevation topography wasn't necessary for me in this case, but you might choose a, to a topographic map to use as your base map. And then also um, mapping some previous excavation data from the 1980s. So before anything, I wanna know where's already been excavated and what did they find? And then I use that to plan um, some magnetic radiometry survey, remote sensing. And that's what you see on the right there, this uh, grayscale map. And I use that to determine where to dig so that I would have targeted areas of excavation saying, I wanna check out that magnetic anomaly specifically um, instead of choosing a random spot. 
Then once we have our project ready, we collect data in the field. Uh, here I'm collecting magnetic radiometry data. Um, it's a Bardington magnetic radiometer at the Audrey Nord site. And other data that's collected that we can use in GIS maps uh, comes in the form of excavation maps. And these can be either digital or hand-drawn. And so that's both of those things are going on in this photo actually. And this is not staged, this is real work. <laughs> um, so you can collect, you can hand-draw maps like these two individuals here towards the front of the photo are doing, or you can collect the data digitally using survey equipment such as a laser total station like these individuals are doing here. And then what we do with that data is we digitize it. We use it to map the site in GIS. Um, and so on the right here is the map that those people were working on. Uh, it is a hand-drawn map. And I was able to take that total station data, that uh, spatial data, bring that into GIS and use it to what we call georeference this excavation map. So georeferencing is putting something in space where it's supposed to go in your GIS map. And then I traced over it to digitize the features that we excavated. So the walls of this house and also the pit features that were either for storage, cooking or processing of food, um, draw those right into the map. And when you do that, you can code those features um, by different pieces of information, which I'll talk about next. So you can also map old excavations uh, from archival documentation, which I have going on on the left. And in this image, there are at least five different layers of information overlaid on top of each other, which is the beauty of GIS. So we can see all at once the aerial imagery, the old excavations, the uh, gradiometry that was collected before excavations, outlines of the anomalies that were observed, and then the new excavation area, all digitized, all in one map. We can use the data that we bring into GIS also to do spatial analysis. And this would be to answer questions such as, what is the layout of the site? And where are certain types of features or material culture found on the site? I have two examples here. The one on the right will do first, since this is also the Audrey North site, which we've been discussing already, in which I uh, digitized the locations of different pit features that I discussed before, and then coded them based on the type of pottery that was found within those features, which basically dated them to either the late woodland period or the Mississippian period. And now we have a color-coded map showing the distribution of those two occupations of the site. On the left side um, is a map that was created by an undergraduate student here and also um, hourly staff up in the archaeology lab, uh, Emily Schottmeyer. And she wanted to look at the distribution of animal bone within what we call the East Village at Angel Mounds. And she uh, plotted the relative distribution of animal bone. And so the larger circles means more fauna and the smaller circles means less. And so you can start to see a pattern right away that in this sort of central area, there's less of it than on the exterior. So there's less um, dumping of garbage in this central area than there is on the exterior. We can also use GIS data um, ultimately to help with site preservation. So we can use overlaid GIS maps to keep track of erosion and slumping of features over time. This feature is mound A at Angel Mounds. It is the largest mound on the site. It, is, um, it has a lower and an upper platform and a conical offset. And um, this is LIDAR imagery, light detecting and ranging. So this is an elevation map of, of the mound. And we can see immediately that there is a drainage ditch forming on the top of the mound and that it's draining out this top right corner here. And then when we overlay it, um, this image, this data was collected by David Massey, who's a geography PhD candidate at IU. And he also created these contours, which really illustrate um, you know, where the eroding soil is, is depositing itself on the site. And ultimately, this is collected in 2019. And so we can do in another couple of years, another um, drone LIDAR survey 
to assess whether that's changed and to come up with a plan with the state, um, with the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites that owns the property at Angel Mounds, um, how we can preserve that particular mound. I thought since this is a um, coffee and curators talk that we should ask how do curators use GIS? Um, and ultimately the same way archeologists do, but um, specifically for IU Ma, we are developing a, in, in addition to the Angel Mounds opening exhibit as part of that, we're developing a virtual reality experience. So visitors will be able to to experience what it was like to stand at Angel Mounds and see the houses and all the activities that are going on there, um, which, will, which is a very exciting project. And GIS is gonna play a big role in that. And so we will be taking this digital information. Um, the stars on this map are the locations of potential places people can visit in the virtual Angel Mounds world. And this data will be given to the computer programmers who are actually developing um, the software that will make it possible for people to experience. I don't know how all that works, that's for a different talk. <laughs> but um, GIS is playing a big role there. Um, and then also a, a more detailed part of that project um, involved the digitizing of Glenn A. Black's excavation drawings from 1939 to 1944. This again is that East Village area that Emily Schottmeyer did her study on. And you can see in this left image, these are, these are the geo-referenced uh, drawings from Glenn Black and it's very busy. There's a lot going on. The rectangles represent house walls. And when we dig them, they just look like brown stains but we draw them and we see the outlines of houses. And it's very busy. There's a lot of overlapping houses. But what we can do in GIS is we can trace over those individual walls and then save them, code them together, group them together as separate buildings. And that's what I've done on the right with the help of Alexander Jacobs, um, who is a graduate from, from Indiana University. So this messy business here then becomes three separate structures. Um, it pops out a lot easier once you code them. Sorry, there's emergency vehicles going by. <laughs> But yes, so GIS has, has been a, real, a really good tool for helping out with that project as well. So with that, I'll leave it to questions. And you are all welcome to either use the raise hand function um, to ask questions, or if you'd like to type them into the chat, that is absolutely fine too. When I'll, I'll kick off with one question. Um, Christina, does ArcGIS give you the capability to correct for, and I don't know what the, the right words probably are, but when you have historic maps, sometimes the scale isn't quite right or it's skewed. Can you correct for that so that you can do overlays with modern maps and, and see how the features align? Yes, you can. Um, as long as you have at least four points on that map that correspond to something that you know is real in your map, mm -hmm. um, you can use those to georeference. And what it will do is it'll it'll stretch out that other image that might not be as accurate um, the, in the best way that it can to overlay um, on your map so that you can use it. So it's it. You know, a lot of them aren't perfectly ideal, but we do the best we can to, to georeference the old maps. Um, and oftentimes they really do line up. And in fact, I've also used um, remote sensing. So that magnetic radiometry, that gray sort of Rorschach looking map that we were looking at before to, to help georeference some old excavation maps. Cause you can see them, they come up as anomalies in the data um, and that helps too. Looks like in the chat, Ed has thanked Christina and I will echo um, his thanks. I think for those of us who had no um, real understanding of how GIS worked ahead of time, this was a really, really nice introduction that was very approachable. And now I'm a little more excited about going to play with GIS and uh, yes. 
learn how to do those story maps and, and use the tool more thoroughly on my own. Um, before we let Christina go, did anyone else have any questions or uh, want to share any of their own experiences with GIS? Christina, what's the next step for you in, in utilizing GIS in your research? Well, um, actually, um, that last image that I showed of the buildings and coding them by the, the many different rectangles uh, and in the different colors, um, that actually is a project that I'm working on um, to examine the architecture at Angel Mounds. Um, we know that they had houses there um, and many people just sort of brushed past that, but there's a lot of interesting detail in that architecture um, that has been um, not paid so much attention to um, until now. So looking at more detail in the architecture um, for sure. And that could lead to all sorts of more questions, but perhaps we'll save those for another Coffee and Curator where you can talk specifically about the architecture um, at Angel Mounds, because now I'm quite curious. All right, you all. Well, I well, really- It looks like Al has a question. Ah, yes. Al asks, are you using GIS to model future erosion or other concerns with site preservation? Um, and I would say, yes, we plan to. Um, we don't have the sort of longitudinal, longitudinal data at this point necessarily to look at changes over time, but now that we have uh, that LIDAR map, that um, colorful um, elevation map that I showed you, we can continue to collect that type of data to, um, to see what, what changes over time and come up with a plan for preservation. All right, I didn't see Al's question come in, so I'm glad that you did. Thank you, Christina. Um, if there are no further questions, I propose we give Christina our thanks and call this a good coffee break. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you had a good cup of coffee. <laughs> And for those of you that are available later in the month, we will have the second in our series, which will look at the archaeology of childhood at Wiley House. And that will be a talk by Liz Watts Malukos. And information is on our website, iumaa.iu.edu. And I hope we'll see you then. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.